Well, everyone, this episode of the podcast is sponsored by 101 Hemp, the makers of premium full-spectrum raw CBD oil products. Now, there's a few reasons why I'm such a fan of this company. Aside from the fact that they're the best hemp-derived CBD oil company out there, by far, hands down, in my opinion. I also love the fact that they're a family-owned business, and they have a great story on how they came to CBD, how they came to embrace CBD, and how they just built their company. Another thing that I really like about them is that they're a huge supporter of the Autism Hope Alliance, which as a consumer really does prove to me that they really want to give back to the wider community. So go over to 101hemp.org and get yourself some premium full-spectrum raw CBD oil products. And don't forget to use coupon code IMGS25 so you can get 25% off of that order. Okay, now let's start the show. Brothers and sisters, welcome back. This is the In My Grow Show. I'm your host, Alex. I want to thank you once again for taking the time to hang out, man. I truly do appreciate it. A little later in this show, I am going to have, uh, I am going to play a conversation that I had with Graham Farrar, who is the founder of Glasshouse Farms. But before that, hey, uh, I hope everyone's gardens are looking great. I hope everyone's outdoor harvest is going well. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I hope everyone's um, harvests are going well. It is October. If you're outdoors, you should be rolling it up, getting ready to chop everything down. My harvest went okay. Um, late in the game, uh, one of my plants ended up getting some caterpillars, so they took some damage. They're up now, hanging up. Um, I've got one other plant, which is the cool one. She's. I'm going to let her go to term um, because I did start her late. She's the one that I actually seeded, that, that I pollinated seeded that I pollinated. So that should come down in a few weeks. Uh, but you know what? The thing I've got to get is, let me restart my notes here, is um, some sticky traps because I still get some white fly issues. So I've got to get some sticky traps and just control that a little bit better because they are annoying, man. I don't have a lot of like aphids. I don't have a lot of spider mite issues. You know, that's by design, but those damn white flies fucking, they're a pain in my ass. So I'm going to try a couple of things. I'm going to try a couple of different things. Um, I'm going to get sticky traps and I'm also going to get some, I'm either going to put some garlic in some pots, you know, garlic plants. Hopefully the smell will deter them a little bit. And I think I'm also going to get some, uh, what is that? Red kale. That seemed to work pretty well for the white flies. But we'll see. That'll happen later today. I'm probably going to go to the nursery. But, um, yeah, so check it out. I've been checking the weather and, you know, weather men are talking about the weather people. They're talking about how it's a La Nina season, not El Nino. So when it's an El Nino out here in California, we get a really wet, rainy season. When it's La Nina, we get a really dry season. Um, that doesn't go, that's not good news, mostly because we've been in a drought for a while. But on the plus side, that means that um, it's going to be a lot a lot easier to grow in the wintertime outside in California, at least on the West Coast. Maybe just, or maybe on the West Coast, right? Uh, so I am going to put together, I have to put back together the grow locker. And I'll post up pictures about what it looks like now and what it's going to look like. It's got a couple of T5 lights uh, for the um, compartment up above for, you know, sprouting and, you know, just cracking seeds. I've got to get that all put together. The fan needs to be cleared. And I also got to get, uh, I got to clean out the, the carbon filter that's in it as well. Man, there's a lot of traffic noise today. Anyways. Mm, what else? Oh, I got to get new lights too. I'm going to get some of those grow light bulbs. I think there's some white LED GE light bulbs. I'm going to get some of those along with the T5s that are in there. But, I'll, you know, I'll post up pictures about it. What else do I got? So I learned something a couple of weeks ago. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Surfer Magazine. So Surfer Magazine's been going on for like 60 years. And, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Surfer Magazine. Eh, I mean, I'm a fan enough. 
But this is their most recent cover for winter 2020. And it turns out that after 60 years, Surfer Magazine is no longer going to be published. Um, they're calling it quits. And, you know, everything I read about it, it seems like it's it's kind of the perfect storm of the quarantine because... You know, the quarantine basically shut down all travel, which if you shut down travel, you don't have surfing competitions to report on. And, you know, a lot of beaches, at least in America, were closed. I don't know about around the world for a while. It was just a weird thing how they closed the beaches. You weren't even allowed to surf. They didn't want you in the water. It was a weird thing. And, uh, yeah, they were trying to ticket people. It was a trip. Anyways, getting back to Surfer Magazine. Yeah, it just seemed like the perfect storm between the quarantine and I think just digital media. Um, and it's a little tragic for me because when I was a kid, man, I was like 11 years old when we moved from California to Texas. And uh, that was a bit of a culture shock for me. Let me tell you. And one of the things that really kept me, I don't know, sane and rooted back in the California culture was picking up Surfer Magazine. You know, it was, yeah, you know, it was just one of those ways for me to connect back. Uh, so, you know, it's uh, kind of a bummer for me, man, that Surfer Magazine will be no more. But um, at least I got the last issue. That's a good thing. I mean, a copy of the last issue. I didn't get the last issue. So, yeah, that sucks, man. After 60 years, uh, no more Surfer Magazine. But you know what that tells me is that after the quarantine, it looks like there's going to be, you know, room for a new Surfer publication we'll see but anyways yeah there you go another sign of the times now i want to move on to a bit of a product review this is um, again one of the products that sespe creek collective set sent over for um their taste tester club i don't know if that's what we're calling it i don't know but today it's going to be this uh canna Cannabis-infused social tonic. And let's do a little unpacking here. It's a big bag. And I had to cut the Ziploc part because it was hard as fuck to get open. At least for me it was. Right, and, you get, and you get these little pouches. These little pouches. See, that's about the size of a lighter. I don't have a lighter here. Mm, it's called the Roadie. And uh, this is the lemon lavender flavor. It has 2 milligrams THC and 4 milligrams CBD and 30 calories. Uh, it says open, pour, 7 ounces into 7 ounce drink, liquid mix, and enjoy. See that right there? Now, each little package is 2 milligrams THC, 4 milligrams CBD, as I said earlier. Um, it made me feel, you know, after about 15 minutes, I felt a little, like, stoned, a little buzz. Not a lot. Not, nothing really noticeable. I mean, you know, it was a little noticeable, but nothing like, uh, you know, it's not like I felt afraid or anxious or anything like that. It, it was an okay feeling as far as the high part. Um... Now, I may not have felt too high with this, but you know what I did feel was um, after like an hour and a half, maybe, I got really tired, really sleepy. So that was really the only downside to it. I mean, not sleepy enough to where I felt like I was fighting to stay awake, but it, it did kind of zap my energy. Um, so yeah, that's the Can, can Roadie. I think that's called Can, right? C-A-N-N. -N. And they're pretty cool. They're all right. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend them. I'd have people pass them on. Again, I want to thank Sespe Creek Collector for sending that over. That was real nice of them. All right, now let's get to the strain of the week. And today it's going to be the 805 Glue. And this, is, and this was put together by Pacific Stone. Now the 805 Glue is a cross between the chocolate diesel and the sour diesel. Now the buds were pretty small. There were some nice popcorn buds, which, you know what? I don't really mind popcorn buds. Or little nugs, mostly because, you know, it all goes into the grinder anyways and just gets ground up. So, big buds, little nugs, it, it, it all smokes the same to me. You know, and it has this nice, fuely kind of um, citrus flavor at the end. I mean, the aroma is total fuel and citrus, but the flavor is just that little hint of, of, of my lemon, something at the end there when I exhale. So, I liked it. It was nice. 
And you know what? Even though this came in at like a 23% THC, it didn't feel that heavy. You know what I mean? It didn't really get in the way of things I had to do. It was nice and nice and level. You know, it was nice. It, it was a good. It was a good daytime smoke, man. You know, and some people on the internet said that this flower gave them the munchies. Um, that really wasn't the case with me. I I didn't get that that munchy feeling at the end. And Pacific Stone is what's known as a value brand. You know, um, it's a decent high, like I said. It's a twenty three percent. Um, but it's no frills, and I wish I didn't throw away the packaging, because the packaging is just a small, like, Ziploc bag, you know. Um, and they're known as value brands because I picked up that eighth for about 25 bucks. So it was it was a really nice price for the, the kind of high that it gave. It was a really good bargain. So shout out to Pacific Stone for the, the really good work they did on that 805 glue. Now, getting to our social media, um, the winner of the Canna Queen Genetics giveaway that we did on Instagram, the winner was, um, let me see if I get this right, Skunks? That is S-K-U-N-T-X. Uh, at Skunks, uh, she won the giveaway. Congratulations to her. Your seeds are on its way. And I want to thank everybody who participated, who took the time to actually uh, follow the rules. Uh, thank you very much. That was a lot of fun. You know, that was the first giveaway for the show, and it will not be the last. And I also want to thank Canna Queen Genetics for, you know, giving us the seeds to have that giveaway. Thank you again, Canna Queen. Truly do appreciate that. Don't forget that uh, to check out her show, Candid with Canna Queen. That is Sundays at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Yeah. Now let's do the report from the cannabis front line. And the first story comes from the Cannabis Business Times. It, um, it's, not, it's not so much a story more than it is an announcement. It says, Soilless Substrate Research Seeks Growers' Input. A multidisciplinary team of seven North American universities and federal laboratories led by Dr. Jeb Fields at the Louisiana State University Agricultural Center is seeking input from growers and grow media manufacturer suppliers across the continent representing multiple sectors and demographics to identify needs, innovations, and, uh, and constraints when producing specialty crops with soilless substrates. It goes on to say, the goal of the five-minute survey is to determine the needs, cost restraints, material availability, and overall sustainability to ensure successful paths forward for each crop sector and within emerging markets, including cannabis and hemp. Growers who are interested in providing input can participate in the online survey. And there is a link in the show notes if you want to participate in that survey. So it turns out that the, uh, let's see here, the United States Department of Agricultural Specialty Crops Research Initiative wants um, people who grow in substrates, people who grow in soilless medias, um, their input on, you know, what are the limitations, what are the good things, the pros and cons about them. And that's pretty awesome. I like the way the government is really looking into different ways that we can produce, you know, not just food crops, but commodity crops as well, you know, um, just being able to use all the resources. And the fact that they're pulling in, you know, the cannabis industry, the hemp industry, that they're actually wanting their input is, is even better. It's even just makes it more acceptable, normalizes it a little better, a little quicker, in my opinion. So I think that's cool that, that the American government is looking into a lot of the different ways that we can actually, you know, farm you know, use soilless technologies. So again, if you are interested in taking that survey, uh, there is a link in the show notes for this article. And the next article also comes out of the Cannabis Business Times, and it is entitled, A New Bill in D.C. Would Allow Returning Citizens to Work in the Medical Cannabis Industry. And it was put together by Melissa Schiller. Starts off, D.C. council members introduced a bill October 9th that would allow returning citizens to work in the medical cannabis industry, according to the DCist.com report. Um, when they're talking about returning citizens, they're talking about citizens that are coming back into the workforce who have just been released from prison. The legislation would repeal a rule included in the Legalization of Marijuana and Medical Treatment Initiative of 1999 that prevents anyone with a felony conviction or misdemeanor cannabis offense 
from working at a medical cannabis cultivation center or dispensary. Well, that's pretty cool for DC. I'm glad to read that, man. Really, any wow, even a misdemeanor cannabis offense, you can't be in the industry out there. Um, that's pretty cool for DC. I, I'm really glad to hear that. That's awesome. That goes a long way with, um, again, normalizing cannabis. Anyways, I'm glad all the way around for DC. That is an awesome thing to hear. Now, the last article of the day comes from the Marijuana Moment, and it is a true um, look into the hypocrisy of American politics with cannabis. It's entitled, U.S. Government Supports Removing Marijuana from Strict Global Drug Schedule. This was put together by Kyle Jager, 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 one of those. It starts, the U.S. government is backing a World Health Organization recommendation to remove marijuana from the most restrictive global drug scheduling category. Though it opposes separate cannabis re reform proposals, including one to clarify that CBD is not under international control. So there was a meeting at the UN and um, the U.S. State Department made a statement. The meeting was about um, rescheduling cannabis. Cannabis has a Schedule 4, which is the most restrictive for the UN for drugs, whereas in America it's a Schedule 1, but that's nothing to do with the other. But anyway, so um, the U.S. State Department <laughs> sent a representative to, um, what was her name, Pat Prug, I believe her name was, to, you know, make a statement on behalf of, of rescheduling cannabis. And this is what she said. Or this is what the, the State Department said. The status or stigma of being a Schedule 4 did not prevent the dramatic escalation of cannabis use. And it is unlikely that removing it will lead to any increase. Keeping cannabis and cannabis resin in Schedule 4 despite scientific evidence will signal that the commission is tone deaf and out of touch. They will ask why. Why do we need a commission on narcotic drugs? Why do we need a scheduling process if all it does is make drugs even less accessible to those in pain and suffering, she said. So, I mean, this is a weird statement for the U.S. State Department to make <laughs> at the U.N. about the, 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 how useful cannabis is. I mean, these are great statements. Everything she said is right. Why don't they use that same thinking to reschedule cannabis here in America? You know, it's just the hypocrisy of it. I don't know what they're... I mean, what are they winning by, by going to the UN and saying, hey, take it off of this restrictive scheduling, but yet again, keep it really restrictive here in America, federally? Um, yeah, man, it's a weird... Like I said, it's a, you can just... It's dripping with hypocrisy, you know? Um, I think we need to, the, the government needs to have one unified message about it. It's either good or it's bad. You know, it's either bad and no part of it's, no part of it is useful. Then they need to band up a dialects, you know, um, or it's good and they need to allow everyone to take it and they need to take it off of the Controlled Substance Act. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, do me a favor, the um, links are in the show notes, so you can read those articles whenever you need to, and let me know what you think, man, for sure. And that, brothers and sisters, is the report from the Cannabis Frontline. All right, so next, um, I do have a conversation to play for you that I had with uh, Graham Farrar, who is the founder of Glasshouse Farms in Santa Barbara. We had a really awesome conversation about lots of different things, not just about the um, history of cannabis in Carpinteria, California, but also about how big greenhouse cultivations, you know, deal with odor control. You know, what kind of IPM do they run? It was an awesome conversation and really glad uh, Graham took the time to be on the show. So hang tight, everybody. I'm going to play a little bit of music and I'll be right back with that. So check it out, brothers and sisters. Today with me on the show, I have got Graham Farrar, who is the founder of Glasshouse Farms. Graham, brother, welcome to the show, man. Thank you very much for taking the time. I truly do appreciate it. Awesome. Great to be here. Thanks for having us. I like the stuff. 
Yeah, man, I'm glad we could finally put this together, man. Um, so real quick, man, so Glasshouse Farms, I just want to start off just with getting a little bit of history of, of you. <laughs> How long have you guys been in production? Yeah, so um, I think, you know, personally, I'm, I'm a long time, you know, 25 plus uh, year lover of cannabis. My work background actually is on the tech side. I'm kind of a tech geek. I was original guy in the uh, internet world. And then most recently was one of the original founders of Sonos, which you might have uh, at your house is a home audio, uh, wireless home audio system, super cool product. Um, and then I moved uh, kind of officially formally uh, to cannabis about half a decade ago when we started uh, Glasshouse Farms in 2015. So, but, uh, you know, not, not, not the oldest in the game for sure, but we've, uh, we've been here for a minute. So that you guys were in production back when it was just medical then? Yeah, yeah. We started in the Prop 215 days. Actually, you know, our first farm was a full Prop 215 farm, six plants for, uh, for patient recommendation. Uh, the whole bit, we were a, a collective uh, nonprofit co-op. And then uh, when Prop 64 passed and got put into place, uh, we made the, the transition from uh, Prop 215 uh, to Prop 64 and, and uh, as well as uh, opened up our second farm uh, also here in, uh, on the coast in Santa Barbara. So between those two, we now have uh, 500,000 square feet of uh, fully licensed and in-production greenhouses uh, here in Santa Barbara. Oh, yeah, and I, uh, I really love every time I go into one of those um, cultivation sites because just the acreage of greenery, uh, you know, I can't stop smiling, man. I love it. Yeah, and it's like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, got, I got to pinch myself every once in a while and be like, you know, every, every, this, this is cool, right? Everyone's okay, but we're we'll walking through acres of beautiful beautiful green happy cannabis plants and like i got two kids and i'm going home and i'm gonna see them and everything tonight right like everyone's good at this right just, just double checking but that, that is the new world and uh you know it, it came with a, a lot of regulations and bureaucracy and stuff like that but uh the upside is uh we can do what we love to do uh and focus on taking care of our plants uh is the number one priority and not have to be uh looking over our shoulder for uh for some guy uh, trying to come in and chop them down because now uh, we're tax paying business owners like uh, like everybody else, and uh, we're uh, we're uh, one of the one of the good guys, I guess. Yeah, I mean that's one of the things we really have to point out is that uh, you know just the fact that we have the market set up that way to where producers or anyone in the legal market doesn't have to worry about their door getting kicked in, at least not by the feds. Yep. Um, yeah, no, I mean, no, yeah. So I mean, we are, uh, you know, that like I said, there's a, there's pros and cons to the whole thing. Uh, cannabis, obviously, uh, at least in, in I, and I'm going to guess you're and your listeners' opinion, has always been a positive thing for society. Um, but, you know, the, the rest of the world for the last 50 years has, has taken a different view on that. So, you know, with all the positives and the negatives, really happy to see uh, the progress. Uh, as, as Martin Luther King Jr. says, you know, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And it does feel like we're starting to, to bend, uh, bend back towards uh, something that makes a lot more sense for us and the planet and the economy and people's jobs and you know, health and wellness and having fun on a Friday night, too. Well, brother, hey, I think you're the first one to ever quote Martin Luther King on the show, man. Good on <laughs> you. That was awesome. <laughs> Fuck yeah, man. That, that's totally awesome. <laughs> hey, I agree gotta, with that completely. Stand on the yeah, yeah, man. You gotta stand on the, uh, on the wisdom of our forefathers, right? I mean, uh, who are we but uh, better reflections of the people past? For sure, for sure. Hey, so getting back to Glass, to, to glass House, um, now, about a little over a year ago, you also opened up a storefront, a dispensary, right, in San, in the city of Santa Barbara, yep. the pharmacy? Yeah, yeah. So does that make you yeah, guys... So Santa Barbara's my hometown. Does that, make you guys, does that make you guys vertically integrated? Is that what's considered vertically integrated from seed to store shelf? Oh, yeah. I mean, we are we are one of the, uh, the few truly vertically integrated cannabis companies in California. Um, it's a term that gets kind of thrown around, I think, somewhat somewhat loosely sometimes, but we, we actually have every single license type that you can have in cannabis uh, with the exception of a compliance testing lab, which we are not allowed to have because we have all the other license types. So we got a half million square feet of operational greenhouse. Uh, we have four adult use dispensaries. We have 22,000 square feet of manufacturing lab, which is both type six, which is solventless, and type seven, which is the hard one of solvent with all the C1, D1 rooms. Uh, we have distro licenses. We got four different brands. So uh, we, you know, we really have the, the four delivery operations, so we really have the whole gamut. Uh, anything in cannabis in California, we are uh, we are got our hands in it. Hey, so I'm wondering, does um does all the flour you produce does it go strictly to the um, Glasshouse brand, or do you guys white label? Yeah, so we, you know, we started in Prop 15 before there was uh, you know brands like there are today, and so we really we started out as a uh, 
and if you kind of call it all wholesale because mostly it was stores who would buy from us and then they were you know packaging into smaller quantities on their own and then it started to be some brands our glasshouse farms brand is, uh, is absolutely on fire right now i think you know we're making a really great product at a really amazing price and it feels like you know it's resonating uh with the market a lot right now it's you know typically sold out when it hits the uh shelves of the distributor within you know hours if not minutes um people are really really loving it so more like you know everything that we're growing now is really targeted um into that brand we do do some white label uh work with the uh, partners that we've had for a long time and are stoked to be working with them and you know kind of supplying uh production orders for their brands um but you know we keep expanding our cultivation so we started all wholesale and then we kind of used it up all all in the brand and then we had the second farm and we're yeah, I, I want to take a moment and uh, let you know, you guys are doing some really killer work with some flour out there, man. And like you said, you're bringing it in at a pretty decent price point for the public. I mean, the public's getting, how I see it, a nice product at a decent price, at an affordable price. Um, so good on you guys, yep. man. You know, truly do appreciate that as a consumer, you know, um, to yeah. see yeah, that. Well, thank, yeah, thanks a lot. I, I'm ha- happy to hear that feedback. That's, that's definitely our goal. You know, I sometimes say... Uh, you know, what I'd really like to be is kind of the Casamigos of cannabis, right? It's like the great product it was that, you know, works every day. It doesn't need to be someone's graduation or something like that. It's okay to, you know, you can use it in a margarita. Uh, you can take a shot of it. It's good on a, a Friday night party. It's good on a, on a Tuesday, uh, you know, evening uh, dinner. It's just, you know, it's kind of always the right answer. And uh, for us at Glasshouse, uh, quality, consistency, and efficiency are kind of the, the things that we focus on. And the reason I put efficiency on there is uh, efficiency to me means being able to bring that quality consistently to the consumer at a better price, right? Like I, I believe in cannabis uh, making the world a better place, and and it, but it can only do that if people get access to it. So part of what we're trying to do is is bring it in at a price that people uh, can afford, even with all the taxes and new rules that Prop 64 brought. We're still trying to make a product that uh, that people can get get you. Hey, so now since you brought it up, because of those, I'm I'm wondering because uh, I know you guys use for your, for your IPM, you guys do use biological predators. Um, was mm-hmm. that was that a choice that you made because of just there's so much regulation, or there's very little insecticides that you can actually use on cannabis, or was it more of uh, a, um, a production? You quality? know, I. I yeah, you know, it's, it's really both, right? And I, I think uh, uh, certainly there's a lot of regulation in cannabis, you know, 66 different pesticides uh, down to the parts per billion in California, uh, which is, you know, really a, it's a pretty mental standard. But, uh, you know, it's, it is it is what the rules are. Um, but also because, you know, we, we like to use what I call the triple bottom line at Glasshouse, which is uh, good for the planet good for the consumer and good for the business, right? And so not using pesticides is certainly good for the planet. Working with Mother Nature instead of spraying toxic chemicals around that kill out everything is a, is a better, lighter touch uh, on the planet. It's good for the consumer uh, because we know uh, that it's safer and healthier for them. Uh, and it's good for the business, too, because uh, the easiest way to pass a pesticide test is, a, is not to use any of them. Um, and so uh, we've leaned in heavy uh, to the IPM or Integrated Pest Management um, you know, essentially pesticide free, all bugs. Um, but then there's some nice, uh, you know, I think there's some great crossovers from that, right? As, as we and other people in cannabis use more bugs, the bug production goes up, the cost comes down. And my hope is that other agriculture, right? I mean, a much bigger piece of the agriculture in California then has better access to use them themselves because the price is lower, right? And we have margins of cannabis that can support us doing some things that a, you know, a strawberry farmer might have a harder time doing. But if the price comes down, then they can they can do it healthier as well, and that's a win for everybody. Hey, so in that IPM with the biologicals, do you also um, use trap plants at all to help either trap pests or to either also just keep a nice community of biological predators, you know, alive and you know in the in the greenhouse? You know, we we don't use a lot. The other name that people refer to those as is banker plants. So basically, for for people on the show who might not know, a banker or a trap uh, plants are kind of two different ways uh, of approach. Where basically you put uh, out plants in a banker plant. Uh, and in that case, it's a plant that the good bugs really like. So you're trying to kind of attract them. Uh, in a trap plant, it's a it's a plant that the bu- bad bugs like more than uh, your cannabis plant. Um, but we we actually don't do a lot of that just because we are turning over so quickly here and rely on it so heavily um, that while that's kind of like a good supplement, it's, it's a hard replacement 
um, for pesticides, which is really what we're trying to do. So our approach is we, we work with a co- couple of insectorias, they call them. So it's basically a, a farm for bugs. Um, and we probably, you know, we probably have a tw- between the two farms, we probably spend fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a month in bugs alone. And so we bring in the bugs that they grow for us based on what our spotters are saying that there's pest pressure on, and then we distribute those bugs directly. So we take a little bit more proactive approach than you would get with either a banker or a or trap plant. Yeah, that's actually I've got to go down to the insectary here to Rincon Vitova and pick up some stuff today. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Perfect. And mostly yeah, because be we buy a lot of bugs from them. Be- and mostly because I live up in Ojai. It's been fucking hot up here the last couple of days. I can't put any predators out because they'll just they'll hate me and die. Uh, <laughs> yep. Hey, so another thing I wanted to talk to you about is one of your farms. I don't know if both of your farms are butted up against the small town of Carpinteria. And uh, Carpinteria mm-hmm. has a pretty shaky or contentious uh, history with cannabis industry because it's not just your farm that's butted up against them it's several others and i know when cannabis that first harvest of cannabis came in a um of wreck i think it was 2018 that you guys got a lot of pushback from it man can you talk a little bit about what happened yeah so i mean i think it's important uh, you know i would not color the town of carpenteria with having a shaky thing what it is is it's a very few but very loud uh residents in carpenteria um, typically what you're talking about is kind of an older, uh, you know, I mean, you, you, it might not be unfair to say they're, they're, the, they're the part of the society that still thinks cannabis shouldn't be here, right? So, uh, I don't know if you're a neo-prohibitionist or just somebody, someone who's not been educated yet, but, you know, one of the other sayings I got is the future's already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And while I think, you know, folks like us and I'm, I guess the people listening to you uh, have, have moved on and recognized cannabis as a positive, uh, piece of our society, that's, you know, it Prop 64 passed by about 70%, right? But that means that if you got 10 people, three of them voted against it, right? And so those three people still think cannabis is a bad thing, and they don't like uh, the fact that it's in their uh, town, and so uh, they're sometimes pretty pretty noisy about it. We work really hard to be good with our neighbors. We have, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of odor mitigation systems. We spend, you know, t- tens of thousands of dollars a month on carbon filters and uh, neutralizers and things like that so that we don't bother those people that are bothered by it. Um, we're lucky at Glasshouse that neither one of our farms are really like kind of right up against the neighborhood. But there is, you know, close proximity of greenhouses and, uh, and, and residents here in Carpinteria. So, you know, I don't know. You've, you've been, you're around here, so you know, like, uh, cannabis from Carpinteria has probably been here for close to a decade. Not, not a lot of people uh, know that. It, it just kind of started getting talked about about five years ago. Um, for some reason, the, the five years before that didn't seem to, you know, it was not a topic. But then once people realized what was happening, those kind of, you know, loud opposition folks um, really had a problem uh, that they raised with the odor and traffic and all, you know, all these other kind of made up, uh, you know, imaginary concerns, you know, things that didn't pan out to be true. Let's say that they were worried about traffic. They were worried about crime. They were worried about property values. None of those things happened. There is less traffic. Crime rates are down. Property values are up. So, you know, all this kind of concern didn't pan out, but that's, you know, those concerns come from 50 years of uh, our government telling people that marijuana is uh, cannabis is no known medical benefit, high, you know, schedule one, right? High potential for abuse. It makes the world a better, a, a worse place, right? Reality is it makes it a better place. So I think more and more people are understanding that. In the meantime, uh, we go through a lot of effort and work uh, so that we don't bother those few people who are concerned, but are, uh, are very noisy about it. So, you know, all in all, I think, uh, Santa Barbara County, Carpinteria, you know, huge production of jobs. Uh, they just reported five and a half million dollars in the last quarter. So that's like twenty two million dollars a year uh, in new taxes for Santa Barbara, uh, as well as, you know, that's keeping libraries open and firefighters employed and off a of furlough. And in you know, the world of COVID, there's not not a lot of good news uh, on the economy. Cannabis is a big exception of that. And it's really pumping a lot into the economy, and creating jobs, keeping people working. So I think it's a, it's a pretty awesome thing all the way around. Hey, so. Now, well, on that note, brother, do you think, I mean, do you think the county should go back and actually rethink the limited licensing and just leave it, let the market bear what it's going to bear as far as, let's say, storefronts or cultivations just because of the need for, uh, uh, you know, to fill those coffers? Um, I'm, uh, I'm always a free market guy. I think uh, the free markets are good at sorting things out. Uh, that said, um, I uh, understand um you know, the concern of like moving into something new 
in a measured pace. Uh, the reality is that the applications that are in right now are going to take, you know, it's going to take the county uh, at least a couple of years to get through them anyway. So putting a, uh, a pause on accepting new applications, at least until they get through the stuff that they have, um, you know, it's, not, it's probably not the worst thing in the world. We got, uh, we got a lot of stuff in, in, a, in a process and we should get through that and let people see that it's not a problem and be comfortable with it. And if there's anything that needs to be uh, tweaked or adjusted, then we can tweak it and adjust it and then open the doors back up. Hey, so I want to take you back real quick for a minute and talk about <laughs> odor control because I've always wondered how easy or how difficult is it to have odor control in a greenhouse? Um, because I'm assuming it's a greenhouse where you have some open panels that open up sometimes to vent air, you know. I mean, how hard is that to, to dial in your odor control? So, um, I mean, it's a, co- a couple of things. Yes, the greenhouses are open. And one of the benefits of being in Santa Barbara is that we have this really ideal climate, right? So if you think about it, uh, it's a perfect place to grow cannabis. It's got water. It's got sun. It's got nice weather year round. I mean, you know, it's 350 days basically of sunshine. We're close to Los Angeles, you know, an hour and a half away. We're the biggest cannabis market in the world. So, you know, one of the really great things from the environment's point of view, from the cost of the product for the consumer point of view is in Santa Barbara, it's like, you know, we get this free sun. Uh, we grow all in, all the natural sun, so our plants are literally made up photons from outer space, which is cool. Uh, when it does get warm, uh, you know, typically it's the ocean breeze kicks in, uh, you know, in the afternoon, and then just by opening the ridge vents, we can get a really nice climate for the plants. We don't have to spend a ton on supplemental lights. We don't have to spend money on air conditioning. And so, like, you know, having these greenhouses that can vent naturally and work with Mother Nature is, is a real benefit for, for everybody. Um, from the odor control point of view, you know, I personally love the smell of it. Most people I know are not bothered by it. There are a few, you know, small percentage of the population who seems to really not like it. Either that's because they actually don't like the odor or they don't like what it represents, which is cannabis in their, in their community. Um, we do a lot, uh, to, to work on that. Um, uh, so there's two kind of main approaches. One is that we use carbon filtration, um, and any closed, you know, buildings like warehouses and things like that. The other is we use this really cool system, uh, which is a, an odor neutralization system. So it's not masking. It's not like a fragrance that covers it up like Febreze. It's actually like a liquid carbon uh, filtration unit. Um, if you want to get techy or geeky about it, it uses a process called adsorption, which means that the two pieces stick together. Um, the way that the, your smell in your nose works is it, it, it recognizes smells by shape. Right. So if you think on the molecular level, the shape of the molecule is what tells your nose what it smells like. So if you change the shape, you change the odor or even better, you change it into nothing. And so the way that it works is we put out a vapor of essential oils, all food grade, you know, terpenes and things like that, natural stuff that comes off of plants. It combines with the terpenes from cannabis. The new combined piece stuck together uh, has a different shape. And so your nose doesn't recognize it as, as a smell at all, or particularly the smell of cannabis. And so then it, it takes, you know, what could be uh, a, a nice smell in farm and tamps it down when you go, you know, uh, off the property line and into the neighborhoods and things like that. You don't smell a strong cannabis odor. Yeah, brother, I'm with you. I uh, I love driving through Carpentry, especially, you know, right at that Foothill Road, um, <laughs> you know. Uh, wow, but what a trip, though, man, that uh, your odor control. Wow, that's a... Uh... That's a trip, man. Hey, so now I want to talk to you a little bit about just the storefront. Um, so Santa Barbara's kind of no- Santa Barbara's kind of known as being like the American Riviera. Uh, before COVID, before the quarantine, how much of your sales came from tourists or from people out of the county or out of town? Um, you know, that's, that's uh, let's see, what would I say? We we are a pretty local store. Um, uh, in, in normal in normal circumstances, right? Uh, so the pharmacy Santa Barbara is on the corner of Mission and De La Vina, which is right downtown Santa Barbara. Uh, one of the things that the city of Santa Barbara did that I thought was really cool is they, you know, they put us through the ringer uh, in terms of vetting. They only gave out three licenses. You know, it was a multi-year process to, to get kind of approved. But once they'd approved us, now they said, okay, we picked you. You're you're our partner in this. And, but you're now you're a regular business, right? You can put your store where stores belong, not down by the dump or over at the strip club or kind of like some seedy thing. It was, so you know, just, just your store now, right? So we're in the corner of Mission De La Vina. We got a pizza parlor, an ice cream parlor, a restaurant, a coffee shop are all on our neighborhood. So we kind of are on the, you know, the main and main of, for local Santa Barbara folks. Um, certainly we get a lot of tourism, but a lot of the folks that we see normally um, are, uh, are locals. 
Um, with COVID, obviously tourism fell through the floor here. Uh, super painful for the city of Santa Barbara, where so much of their tax revenue is restaurants and hotels. Um, us, on the other hand, saw business go up. Uh, we've been we're busier than we've ever been. Um, lots of locals coming by, getting you know whether it's fun on a Friday night or a tincture on Tuesday. Um, you know, there's a lot more reasons for cannabis, right? Like cannabis is always great, but if your kids came home for spring break in March and never left, cannabis can help with that, right? If you've been staring at the news and watching the case counter, cannabis can help. You can't sleep through the night. You're too stressed out. Cannabis can help with that. So we're seeing a lot more locals uh, than ever before. Um, and, you know, and the tourism is coming back and we see the hotels and people to us and stuff like that. So, you know, it's, it's been on the retail side. Uh, I think COVID's been actually kind of perversely. It's been a wind at the back. You know, we were essential, uh, according to the governor of California. So we never had to close. Business just kept going. We moved everybody outside to keep them safe. But more more people than ever uh, come in to uh, stock up and find the benefits of cannabis in their life. Hey, so are you seeing more a number of sales because from the quor- or since the quarantine, mm-hmm. or more, let's say, larger yep. purchases during the quarantine? Like people are stocking up because I don't know they don't want to go out as often. Yeah, we saw stocking up early, right? So like back, if you remember when they first did the stay at home orders, it was absolutely crazy, right? People just come in and like, it was like the toilet paper thing, but for cannabis, right? Oh like, yeah, it was like toilet paper and whatever, kush. You like got to get it all. Yeah. Yeah. And so then people realized, okay, like, you know, zombie apocalypse is not coming, but cannabis, we see like a made big uptick in the new first time customers through this whole thing. Um, uh, and now I'd say it's just, you know, it's, we see more people, we sell more products, I think. You know, June, uh, July, August, and September are three of the best months that we've ever had in our in our history. We've been open for about uh, 13, 14 months now. So, like, you know, those were some of the three biggest months. You know, you would have thought, uh, you know, if you looked at the hotels and things like that, that it would have been through the through the floor, but instead it was through the roof. Yeah, it's um, it's really tripped me out. Just the amount of new people to cannabis. Um, I, I don't know if. I don't know why I was so surprised about it though either, because as far as in, as far as being an escape, I mean, cannabis is pretty good, better than alcohol. Hey, so you're you're a guy focused on brands. Um, I want to get your opinion about uh, Senate Bill sixty seven, which tries to set up appellations, which is like uh, regional areas for certain products. Like let's say you know, like champagne can only be called champagne if it's made in Champagne, France. Yep. Sure. Um, are you are are you looking forward to something like that for the Central Coast or for Santa Barbara? I mean, how would an Appalachians really help you? Yeah, so um, I believe sixty seven was actually signed by the governor, so I think it I think it is in place now. Um, you know, it's it's interesting, right? So we are greenhouse growers. We grow uh, hydroponically. Appalachians, uh, you know, they kind of mimic the wine version. I'm not sure that it's as directly applicable to cannabis uh, as they made it, but that has two requirements one is no supplemental light which is not an issue for us uh we don't use supplemental light but the other is that it's grown in the ground um and for us in a greenhouse we are predominantly hydroponic with uh with substrates so based on that you know technically we're not eligible for uh appellations because we're not grown in the carpentry of soil um i don't think uh that many people will be growing in the carpentry of soil but um you know, until they change that, we wouldn't be in there. There's so there's two things. There's there's Appalachian of origin, which would define like a region, like you know, Carpinteria, or coastal Santa Barbara, something like that, right? And then there's county of origin. County of origin is the way it's always been, and I and I think it's great because you can't put Santa Barbara on your label as the county of origin unless a hundred percent of what you grew was in Santa Barbara. Appalachian of origin is, is a separate level, a separate kind of category, and that needs to be a registered region there and that for us is probably you know I, I don't know i think it's great for the humble guys uh and you know some of those other kind of regional areas but i'm not sure that the consumer we're talking to is gonna have that be a deciding factor for them so i think for us it's kind of neutral you know it's, it's a wash either way so do you think it's just because it's not recognized like like you said like humble they've got you know the 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 name recognition so yeah i guess you know I guess people yeah, aren't I think familiar. Awesome for them. I mean, the real, the real thing, yeah, the real thing for us is because we are not growing in the ground, right? We are growing in greenhouses where we have uh, a substrate that we grow in uh, hydroponically. Then we, we couldn't even do, we can't do the appellation because they require not just the geography and not just the natural sun, but they required it to be in the, in the local soil. And, and we don't, that's pretty atypical for a greenhouse to have a greenhouse with plants 
growing in the ground inside them. We typically grow in some sort of pot or container. Hey, so not to give away too much, but I'm just curious, uh, that substrate you guys growing in cocoa? Yes, yeah, we, we are we are all cocoa growers. We really like that because it's, it's a nice, consistent um, hybrid, right, between uh, soil because we can get in uh, like a, you know, kind of ecosystem going, right, with microbials and things like that, but we can do it in kind of our prescribed the way that's nice and consistent. Um, you know, growing in the ground is great. So, certainly nothing, uh, no bad thing to say about that, but doing living soil in a greenhouse where you're turning things over, uh, it can kind of have diminishing returns. So I like the cocoa because we can, we can be consistent, precise with it, but still build that living web where we're not, you know, totally sterile and totally inert. It's a really nice hybrid, which is, I mean, at the end of the day, why I like greenhouses so much is because there's that real, it's a real great kind of cro- crossover intersection between growing outdoors, natural sun, natural air temperature, working with mother nature and growing indoors, uh, where, where you have some climate control, right? So if things are cool at night, we can warm it up a little bit. If things are warm, we use the ocean breeze to cool it down. We can be precise with our irrigation. We can control humidity, but yet still we have this glass roof and this, you know, the best, uh, the best the lighting system in the universe, the sun, is what's making our plants grow. So, you know, it's kind of that hybrid is, is where we really like to do. Mother Nature came just a little bit. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, whatever you guys are doing, man, you guys are fucking knocking it out. Uh, hey, Graham, so <laughs> sure. this is an election year, brother. Uh, I got to ask you something. Um, if there is a change in the administration... You know, let's just say, and uh, if it goes through, like, let's say Biden actually does decriminalize, uh, like, what is the, what are the one major thing that y- you would like the government to do as far as for cannabis? Um, yeah, so let's see, what do I think? It is an election year. Everyone should definitely get out and vote. Um, it really matters th- this year more uh, than others. Um, you know, I think uh, Kamala Harris, uh, Biden's VP, is on a... Uh, on a real bent to decriminalize things, which I think is awesome. Um, I think she's coming at it from a social justice point of view, which is a, is a valid reason to do it. Um, hopefully we don't lose just, you know, the value of cannabis uh, as well. But, you know, certainly the drug war uh, was put in place to persecute uh, people of color, and it's been successful at that. So stopping doing that and reversing uh, the wrongs that are happened uh, there, I think, should be high on our list. Uh, we see a lot going on in the world right now. Uh, that shows us uh, why, you know, the injustices that are out there and should be raising our attention to fixing them. And, uh, you know, dialing back the drug war is a, is, is a really great place to start on that. Um, I would hope uh, that the government basically kind of takes a, you know, hands-off approach, right? I mean, we need to deschedule this. We need to get banking. Uh, we need to stop making people wonder if they're going to lose their job for using something that's legal in their state. We need tax reform. Um, you know, so something along the line of the Moore Act, uh, would be great where they kind of just say, okay, the federal government, I mean, it, come on, 50, 45 out of 50 states are already doing it, right? Like at some point, the federal government needs to, needs to back off because or else they just look like a joke, right? I mean, it's, when 50 out of 50 states are doing it and the feds say, oh, this is really illegal, you know, like, it, okay, well, now you don't even, you're irrelevant, irrelevant. So I think they don't want to end up there. So I think they, uh, I hope they take a hands off approach, let the states run their rules. Uh, you know, if they want to get a couple percent of tax to help, uh, uh, our economy right now, that could be fine. What I hope they don't do is come in with, you know, another 500 pages of regulation uh, that are end up making things uh, so hard that no one can do it legally, um, and that would be a net loss. So, you know, it, it's time to wake up and get it off Schedule 1. Clearly, there's medical benefits. Clearly, it doesn't have a high potential for abuse. Clearly, we should take our head out of the sand and allow businesses to run. We should allow our financial system to, you know, we kick all this business up to Canada when it's all our companies in the states that are uh, that are really making a difference and you know then all the canadian exchanges are the ones making all the money so let's let's quit being idiots about it and uh, recognize what's there make the world a better place you know prohibition ended and helped pull our country out of uh, the great depression we're gonna we're, we're gonna have issues here because of covid uh decriminalizing cannabis could be a huge boost uh, to help repeat that story and uh, lift our economy back up and i think we should take advantage of it yeah, I've always said I just need the government to, to deschedule and get out of the way. That, that's all I need is just to yep. take it off the Controlled Substance Act and um, let the states figure it out for their for their populace, man. But states need to should set up, you know, once that happens, states should just set up some kind of system. 
Uh, hey, Graham. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Uh, hey, I want to thank you again for taking the time uh, to talk to us. Do me a favor. Can you uh, let everybody know where, how they can find Glasshouse Farms and how they can find the pharmacy? Yeah, for sure. So um, Glasshouse Farms is www.glasshousefarms.org, or probably uh, the easiest, best place to find us is Glasshouse Farms on Instagram. Um, ask for us in any local California dispensary. Uh, you'll recognize us by the uh, bright and colorful, uh, you know, sunshine and blue ocean where the greenhouse is right next to the water on the logo. Um, let your shop know that you want, uh, you know, high quality uh, sun grown uh, uh, cannabis out of Santa Barbara and they'll, uh, they'll know who we are. Uh, the pharmacy is the pharmacy Santa Barbara. We also have the pharmacy Berkeley up here up in NorCal. Um, and that is, uh, the pharmacy sd.com and the pharmacy berkeley.com. Uh, two fantastic dispensaries, uh, you know, whether you are a complete connoisseur, and you, uh, you're going right for the live rosin, or it's the first time you've ever gone into a, an adult use dispensary and need someone to show you around. Uh, the team over there will take good care of you no matter what. So come on by. We'd love to see you. Far out, man. Yeah, for sure. You guys, uh, you can't go wrong with that flower, I'm telling you. Um, they don't pay me to say this. He didn't pay me to come on the show. <laughs> I like their product, man. It's a really decent flower. It's more than decent. Motherfuckers, they get you high. Awesome. Jesus Christ. All right, Graham. Yeah, hey, awesome. uh, I appreciate that. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> yeah, for pleasure. sure. Do me a favor, brother. Don't hang up. For everybody else, I'm going to play a little bit of music, and I'll be right back. Well, brothers and sisters, I hope you enjoyed that. I know I had a great time talking to Graham. Again, I want to thank him for taking the time to to come on the show. Um, and as always, if you have a question or a comment about this episode, you know, send us an email that is in my grow at gmail.com. Well, check it out, mis amigos. That's it. That's all I have to share with you today. That is the end of the show. Now, I want to take a moment to thank all the artists who let me use their music to put the show together. Now, do the show a favor and leave a rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Don't forget to go to inmygrow.com and subscribe to the website. Also, go to youtube.com slash inmygrowshow and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Now, we have had some trouble within the last few weeks with um, the t-shirt part of the website, so that's kind of down for now. But you can still support the show really easily and really inexpensively. Go over to patreon.com slash inmygrow and donate a dollar. That's it, just a dollar. And if you're a cannabis company that wants to advertise on the In My Grow Show, send us an email. That's inmygrow at gmail.com. Well, brothers and sisters, hermanos y hermanas, my fellow cannabis co-conspirators, I'm going to go ahead and get on out of here. You know I love you all very much, and remember to always grow, learn, and teach. Grow, learn, and teach.